This is Rosa Shaw, and I'm here to guide you through the daily activities, events, and the in and out of what occurs on the street. So sit back, relax, enjoy your cup of coffee, purchase one of the some popcorn box, and enjoy a word from the metaverse. Hello, Rosa Shaw is here, speaking to you from a small cafe adjacent to the famous Black Sun Bar, giving you the latest on what is happening on the street and respecting us here. And not only the metaverse, but the world at large. You are listening to A Word from the Metaverse. Now, this is our introductory show, so I'm just going to explain what the point of the existence of this podcast is. And it's basically to bring an understanding of technology that informs our world, uh, covering news, events, software, hardware, companies, and people of the moment. Also, going over the origins of many tech movements, hardware, software, companies, people, and the philosophies that are forming and shaping this very rapid and growing, not only economic and social platform, but a necessity that in order to exist in this world, you must have an understanding of certain concepts of the technology. You must have access to the internet. You may eventually have to have access or understanding of how to code. It's going to be the new language of the world to be in much of a similar way that uh, English or reading or, or writing is a necessity to advance and further yourself uh, economically and socially in the world, you're going to eventually have to learn and understand coding and technology to much of the extent of computers, the usage of computers, you have to understand as a tool. But actually making and building these tools is something completely different and it's reshaping our 21st century. And basically, you know, as we go over the origins and many of these tech movements and and the nature of, the, of these movements in itself, basically I'm just trying to keep you abreast of what's happening, what I like to call the street, but also trying to make this technology understandable, breaking down the bite sizes of it. So the person out there in the world who's listening to this and on their either, uh, iOS device or Android or maybe they're at work, uh, or at home listening to some type of electronic device to listen to this podcast to help you understand what it is that people are talking about. What is being, sh- what is technology really doing to the world? What is, what is shaping it? What is driving it? And make it understandable for the common person. So a bit of an origin. Why a word for the metaverse? Well, metaverse is a term that was coined by Neil Stephan. And I know I'm completely butchering this hand's last name. He wrote a book called Snow Crash. Snow Crash is this book that comes out of the uh, fiction genre known as cyberpunk. If you ever seen the movie Matrix, The Blade Runner, um, the movie Hackers is uh, Angel Jolie and John Lee Miller, uh, War Games. Um, if you ever seen any kind of modern, anything from like, I would say, mid-90s on up when it comes to technology and use of hackers, if you will, has some kind of cyberpunk element to it. And it's a genre on a, of its own from the sci-fi fantasy uh, side of fiction in which it deals with computer technology, hackers, dystopia, and the merging of this technology into the world around us. And it sometimes takes different forms from a kind of a noir type of deal, like a detective type of story, or a completely dystopian type of world where there's like one man or a ragtag of, tag of groups going up typically against corporations. Corporations have supplanted um, governments in the, in the cyberpunk genre when it comes to the dystopian world viewpoint. And this book was pretty influential, much like if it, another name you may have heard of, William Gibson, who wrote a book called uh, The Necromancer. Necromancer. And he is, you know, William Gibson is responsible for a lot of influences. If you ever saw the movie Johnny Manomet with uh, Keanu Reeves, that is based on uh, his, his uh, short story. And a lot of the terms and concepts of cyberpunk, if you will, has um, come out of um, a number of different authors. And we'll cover that um, in the third episode of a metaverse, what cyberpunk is in a, in a particular genre and going in depth about it. But this particular book, Snow Crash, um, a lot of people that are currently 
our heads of a number of technology you currently use, like for example Google, um, have cited as snow crashes and influence and inspiration for them. Uh, the word avatar, you know, if you ever played Sim City or if you ever use Twitter or Facebook or any type of social media app that the little picture or icon, the avatar, if you will, uh, is something that comes, that concept comes from this book. The concept of the metaverse, which is like a virtual reality type of a place where people interact um, in the avatars, these uh, physical forms, if you will, that mirror their own in the real world or could be something customizable, if you will, which is something similar to what if you're a gamer, if, you're, if you ever played a game, you can customize your character. You can do so in this fictional realm called the metaverse. You might see a similar concept if you ever read the book uh, Ready Player One, uh, The Matrix, takes a lot of these, those type of elements of the concept of the metaverse of a virtual reality world where people are able to interact and engage in these kind of fantastical fashions and also take up parts of different aspects of the real world and supplant it in this computer space. And it, it's a very, it's actually a really good book. It's fast pacing. I, I think it's kind of very re relevant to today. And when you read the book and you see some of the things that are discussed and talked about, about particularly about corporations and money, monetary policies and how people interact and engage with technology, the type of jobs that people have, you can kind of see certain elements of what is already existing in the world today, but potentially the negative aspects of where if we don't take certain steps in our society, where the world could go to. But in general, just to kind of give you a plot summary, I'm just taking this from Wicca of what the novel Snow Crash is. Um, it's about a hero protagonist. is a hacker and pizza delivery driver for the mafia. He meets uh, YT, which is short for yours truly, a young skater, skateboard courier, uh, during a failed attempt to make a delivery on time. Um, YT completes the delivery on his behalf. They strike up a partnership to gather intel and sell it to the CCI, which is a profit organization that involved from the CI merging with the Library of Congress within the metaverse. Uh, Hero is an offered as a data file named Snow Crash by a man named Raven, who then hints that it's a form of the new product. Uh, Hero's friend, hacker D5, views a bitmap image containing the file, which causes a computer crash and day five to suffer brain damage in the real world. So Hero has to team up with his ex-girlfriend, uh, Juanita Marquez, who is now the current girlfriend of day five, and they decide to figure out what it is that Snow Crash is and why it's being unleashed onto the metaverse. And that's pretty much the summary of Snow Crash. And there's a lot of things going on there. Like, for example, they, like in the synopsis here, it talks about for-profit organizations merging into what into government organizations. Government organizations once I mean, been government organizations are now for profit um, organizations. You know, the mafia is now running pizza delivery services. So it's a very interesting read, a very interesting book overall. I highly recommend it. You can find it anywhere, Amazon, um, any type of book selling places out there, you, even your local bookstore. I'm pretty sure if you have a local bookstore or even a used bookstore, you'll find a, a copy of Snow Crash for less than, you know, 10 to like 5 bucks. It's not that, that big of an expense to pick up. But that is the inspiration that the universe is built by um, Neil Selfison and um, Snow Crash in itself is where I take the name of the metaverse. Uh, is where also the origin of my personal handling, handle name, uh, uh, Herosia comes from. It's a merger of Hero, Hero and Ja from uh, Dragon Ball Z. When you scream on that show, they're like, ah! You can tell already, I'm a bit of a nerd here. And the shite comes from the angle of Angleization or an Anglo Saxonization of uh, Shiba Nitu, which is a dog, which is a mascot for a cryptocurrency coin called Dogecoin, which we will cover um, through this show, The Metaverse, eventually about cryptocurrency. Uh, or you can listen to Musings of the Shy, which will be um, debuting on the Hiroja Shy Face Odyssey Network within three weeks. I'm firing that up where I talk about Dogecoin and cryptocurrency. But overall, that's you know, the inspiration kind of for the show taking place in, you know, in the Specialized realm in the computer universe, speaking to you about the daily occurrences and events and technology, and making it digestible and easy for people to understand. Now, for just the general format of the show. So, I like to break down um, the show into four concepts, or four, four segments, if you will, uh, with an overall main topic that kind of intersects all these four segments. 
One is new. Uh, the second is highlighting uh, a specific technology that I'm personally using. Third is highlighting uh, any type of uh, technology software or person that might intersect or connect with the overall theme in and of itself. So there is an event that may have taken place within the last couple of weeks or months or something from the past that may inform um, the subject matter of the topic that we're discussing. And the last topic is the manifesto of the episode. The manifesto Manifesto of the episode is just something that uh, ties into the overall theme of the, of the show, but also as a, an informative bit of information. Uh, most of these manifestos are pieces of writing that inform a lot of the thinking of the developers, uh, the concepts of the various products and technology that you are uh, currently using. And it's important in, in the sense that uh, you have an understanding of some of the origins of this stuff. Uh, some of these manifestos also come in, uh, like all movements come in waves. They have been informed um, by earlier manifestos and earlier high technology movements and have taken a certain different philosophy shaped by the time that they are existing and it is written. So that's pretty much how the segments are going to go. So we're talking about things that were launched on the inauguration day. I uh, talked a little bit about the news surrounding that day. In particular, um, one of Shadow Lewis, the actor, uh, who's been known to do some pretty strange things, but also doing on these kind of off the beaten path, not typical someone of his character in Hollywood. Um, I'm not sure you can call Shiloh Booth an A-lister, but he definitely has been an A-list in movies, and he does have a, um, he is a very good actor. Has and he has done a, he has um, sponsored an art piece in Living New York where it's a live streaming video against the wall where people can pretty much say anything they want and you can, he, he will not divide us um, as a protest to the President Donald Trump in an effort to, you know, criticize the administration. It's going to be up there. All four years on the Trump was president. And what had happened was that he was arrested on January 25th as a result of a neo Nazi coming to the live show and disrupting it to the live feed, if you will, and saying 1418, which is a, a neo Nazi slogan, if you will. Not 1418, I'm sorry, 1488 which are the 14 words, uh, we must secure, secure the existence of our people and the future for white children. It was a phrase coined by George uh, Lincoln Rockwell, the founder of the American Nazi Party. And of course, 88 is the H, which is Heil Hitler. And he got it into a fight and he was arrested with the individual who was in the state. Another bit of news and why I bring it up, bring it up was the fact that Richard Spencer, a known um, man who actually popularized, and I believe he actually coined the term all right, was um, punched in the face. He's a neo Nazi. And this article is from The Nation, and here it goes Neo Nazi Richard Spencer got punched, and he could thank the Black Hawk. It is dispatched from inside the J20 protest by Natasha Lenard. I'm not going to read the entire article. What I'm going to read about is about the black block. Because the black block is not, as it's being depicted, depicted in a lot of media sites, an actual group of people, organization. It's an anarchist tactic. And the reason I bring it up is when we talk about uh, various protest movements that a number of, um, where technology played a hand in, particularly the Arab Spring with Twitter. Um, in Iran, there's been at least for I recall in my lifetime of student protests in the last two in which um, the internet played a hand in, you had a lot of people doing the server time to allow for Iranian, Iranian protesters to communicate outside of their country because Iran was uh, cutting off the internet. Um, the things that were occurring in Egypt, the Ukraine, uh, part there's been a number of different uh, political movements. Even Romania, which has just recently had a protest against a bill that had been signed and put into law that would have allowed for bribery to reoccur in the country. And they went out, they almost 
I think the peak was almost 300,000 Romanians went out and protested in their capital. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement utilized technology very effectively, particularly Twitter and social media. And you saw, um, particularly when it came to Ferguson and the clashes with the Ferguson protesters and the law enforcement, you saw people from around the world, um, particularly in Palestine, explaining how to deal with tear gas and no social interaction. So various movements, usage of different types of tactics that are both effective and not effective and what works here may not work necessarily work there, but certain aspects of a particular um, organization or tactic, if you will, can be utilized by people. And the reason I bring that up is because you do decentralized um, systems. You have like various apps, like how was it called? What was it called? Fire chat, which was utilized in Hong Kong under the umbrella movement. Signal, which is uh, often utilized by activists as means of protecting their communication. So yes, fire chat was this uh, symbol messaging system where you don't need a signal, you don't need mobile data. It was built off of your internal phone and Bluetooth, so you're able to communicate with someone who has fire chat as long as they're within, I believe it was like 500 meters of you, which is pretty significant distance. But when you have multiple people utilizing fire chat in, in the same space, you have like a mesh network, so you're able to have a very robust and messaging type of system that cannot be censored, cannot be shut down based on the battery life of an individual's phone. So tactics like this with the black block is something that has been deployed around the world, and I believe it originated in Germany and has spread throughout the world as a means of protesting. And due to communication and ability, communicating one another, um, the black block in this tactic, I think, is something that has been popping up more and more within, I would say, more so in the last 10 years than in previous years. It's been around for almost 30 years, particularly in the States, but around the world as a means of protesting and going against the law enforcement. But I think we get a little bit from the article here. Uh, the Black Bloc is not a group, but an anarchist tactic. Marching is a confrontational unit for uniform and black and anonymous social security. Once deployed, the tactic has an alchemy quality, turning into a temporary object, the Black Bloc. So on Friday, the block I joined in D.C. numbered well over 500, the largest of the kind since the anti-war protests over a decade prior. And I wrote in advance of the inauguration, if we recognize fascism and Trump ascendance, our response must be anti-fascist in nature. Uh, the history of anti-fascist action is not one of polite protest, nor failed appeals to reason debate the basis for direct rest of confrontation. While Platt best associated in the United States with anti-globalization movements, major summit protests nearly two decades, two decades ago, I think she's referring to the um, the Seattle protests that took place in 1989. I'm not positive really if the Black Box was part of that, or the tactics, if you will. I think there's a number of tactics that were utilized during that protest that kind of get meshed together, if I completely wrong. Uh, it's part of a long standing visual, large, international anti fascism or anti fascist For example, block tactics could be used by European anti fascists marching against neo Nazis since the 1990s in Germany. Uh, the similar value of the large Black Box presence at the Trump's inauguration residue the draw a connection between anti-Trumpism and anti-fascism. Uh, typically in these type of um, marches, if you will, um, specifically, um, at least here in the state, um, you, you, I believe that you saw some of this in Venezuela, um, Brazil, a lot of South American uh, countries differently. But here in the states, you typically see mostly white people. And for the predominant region, I have a linkage in in the uh, show notes to the video is because if you are a person of color, um, you're most likely to be arrested and have charges or charges leveled against you of a higher level than say that of uh, a white member of the black bloc. And she points this in the article, um, not everyone can participate in the black bloc. Those with vulnerable immigration status or arrest records or good reason to fear police oppression because of the color of the skin often don't participate in activities where the risk of arrest is high. Uh, Friday's black bloc was by no means all white, but it was predominantly white. And if bearers of white privilege can do one thing is put ourselves on line and task where others can't, which is one tactic. A lot of times um, the black bloc do very extremely aggressive actions against law enforcement. They will engage with law enforcement. They will throw rocks. They will throw bricks. They will um, throw a lot of the, the main target is always, is always Starbucks, breaking windows, um, 
also but using it as a shield, if you will, to allow for protection. You hear the tear gas comes out a lot of times when the Black Rock has um, bandanas to cover the face, but they also have masks and goggles that allows them to be exposed to the tear, tear gas a little bit longer than say someone who is not doesn't have these things that allows them for to be pulled away into the into the crowd and not get picked up by law enforcement. I've seen this happen a few times with these on the Black Rock um, in various protests around the world. But a, a member of the Black Rock is the one responsible for uh, punching Richard Spencer in the face. And if you've seen the video, which has been unified against the soundtrack of which is pretty much any hard-hitting or cool um, song, um, you can maybe the best one was the launch mode, which one I am referring to because there's two that I've seen. But the one that was my favorite is Crane Blue Sky. Yeah. So that's our big news that kind of gives us to our theme of resistance. The usage of tactics, if you will. Anarchism is uh, pretty much linked. Uh, I wouldn't say go hand in hand, but there is a streak of anarchism in uh, cyberpunkdom. And in particular, cyberpunkdom, which is responsible for a number of the technologies that we'll be talking about, particularly decentralized systems like cryptocurrency and PGP and um, a number of different things that you utilize currently um, in your day to day life and don't realize it comes from the cyberpunk or cyberpunk world. So the, uh, the topic that I said earlier is resist. And a number of couple of things happened this uh, week and as well as like, the past month. And we're just going to highlight um, everything that occurred, kind of some of the good deals that happened in January and beginning of this. So we have these centralized systems that are be getting a much broader appeal to people. Uh, a little bit more money, a uh, lot more developers are working in decentralized systems. And I will discuss what this, a decentralized system is. So basically what has happened is that a number of people, rightfully so, are concerned about privacy, they're concerned, they're concerned about access, and they're concerned about the ability to communicate across the world in a free and easy manner without the scrutiny of any corporation, any other person or body or central authority, uh, government in particular, given the like of the a number of the different hacks that have occurred uh, with private information such like as the Yahoo email, the breach, uh, the Edwin Snowden and the Chelsea um, Manning disclosures through WikiLeaks and other regarding another news sources of Snowden and other whistleblowers along the way that have highlighted some of the overarching reach for many of very government bodies, but also the cooperation of corporations in this, as well as the acts of corporations in themselves and the use of information. So what a number of people have done in order to resist and turn the tide of this is in creating decentralized systems to be able to do the everyday activities that individuals are doing right now, like social media, uh, email, uh, voice, voiceover, you know, telephone, you know, communicating in that fashion, uh, website building, uh, servers, hardware, there's a number of different activities. And I'm just going to highlight a few that just kind of popped up. Uh, one, which, which was launched, um, two actually, two projects that were launched on the day the American inauguration of uh, Donald Trump, uh, which I think for both of them would have happened if Hillary Clinton had won um, the election. I think it was just planned for those uh, to launch on that day. Um, it was a response to not only to, to what's happening within the overall infrastructure of the Internet, but, you know, the, the Obama administration, the Bush administration, previous American administrations, and administrations of countries across the world that have done a crackdown on privacy and disclosure and just the monitoring of people all over the world for, they say for whatever reason they say, but in general, it's not considered to be the best of reasons, no matter what the intentions are. So just to kind of explain the decentralized system and why it is happening. Um, first off, there is a flaw within the internet. There are several flaws within the internet, but one of the biggest flaws is, and we'll discuss this when we talk about the creation of the internet and how it came about, 
uh, in future episodes, is that when it was formed and a number of the, the architects, the creators that, that built the platforms and the infrastructure that we currently use now to communicate with one another across the World Wide Web, was that privacy was not embedded within the protocol. It was, you might say it was an oversight by some, there might not have been necessary emphasis, it was something to discuss. It might be another thing was that there was, wasn't a belief, it was a necessity. Um, there's a lot of reasons why it did not occur, but many of those individuals now reflect upon it, believe that that is something that should have happened, that privacy was something that should have occurred and built in with the protocols that would allow for people to communicate with one another without um, such a he heavy-handed scrutiny on behalf of the government, on behalf of corporations, on behalf of anyone, being able to see, you know, your dick pics, if you will, if you didn't actually disclose it to a wide range of people or your grocery list or whatever your communications or communicators, you know, what type of porn you're watching, um, who are you communicating with, um, if you're a protester, an activist, or if you're a startup company and you're communicating with your staff, you could easily be, you know, maybe eavesdropped by, on, by your competitor, Google, because you use Gmail. I mean, there's a lot of things that are going on in the world where, um, you know, because we're humans and humans can be very terrible beings. I'm not one of those individuals that believe that humans are not capable of evolving or changing and that all humans are terrible and horrible, or whatever, but that, you know, some of us are bad actors and bad actors are going to do bad things, particularly when they have access. And one of the, the things is privacy, the ability to not disclose. Not necessarily hide or keep something secret, but not to disclose information. It, it is you who decides to tell someone or tell about a thing to whomever you choose to do so. And you want to control that type of information. Much like we do in the real world, whether it be a personal matter, maybe if you're talking to your best friend about, you know, some home stuff and you, you ask your best friend, please don't tell anyone else about this, and your best friend doesn't do so. Well, you know, if you were to do so over the internet and it could be through your Facebook message and you don't encrypt it, well, just because it gets scooped up by Facebook, those keywords that you're discussing or whatever is on some server somewhere. So at any point in time, someone can recall that information or look at that information. It doesn't matter if it's 5, 10, 20 years down the road or maybe the boyfriend or husband or whatever or significant other, um, not to generalize everybody, gains access for whatever reason to your information and they're, they're able to see what it was said. It's just, you know, silly stuff. I mean, maybe that's not the best example, but you should have the right to disclose what you want to disclose when you want to disclose it. And there's a number of different platforms, like I said, two of them that came online that come fall in the realm of decentralized system. One, not so much, but it's on the privacy realm. And they came online for the sole purpose of allowing people to be able to communicate across the world or even just across the room without that scrutiny. So what is a decentralized system? Uh, to be very brief, because it's a pretty heady and in-depth topic, you know, a decentralized system is in which there is no central point of entry. There's no central point of order or influence. It's a bunch of different individuals acting, acting in a collective fashion in the sense that they're all using the same type of software or hardware program, but they're using it in their own way, at their own pace, at their own time, in a collective effort to communicate discreetly or at will, if you will, without the same level of scrutiny. And so you have multiple different points of nodes or people that are part of the system. And it's not one single person controls it, not one single person is the author. There's not even a group of individuals that are the author or even a company. It is a such a widespread disruption, distribution, which, oh, and also disruption, 
of information and access across a wide band, band of people that anyone and everyone can do this activity, whether it be at the same time or different times or different points in time of existence without anyone denying or preventing or stopping them from accessing the information. You just can't because too many people have access, too many people have the knowledge, too many people have, know how to do it. And so because there's no central point where you can go to, for example, um, it was disclosed today that Google has to hand over uh, foreign emails to the U.S. government. They were subpoenaed and there's like some long, seems like a long protracted court battle was going on. When it comes to emails, there wouldn't be a Google to go to. They would have to actually go to the individual, and if the individual does not that information, there's no way, in essence, for the government to garner access. There's no way for them to go to one place because they don't have direct access to that information. I will have a, a link in the, the show notes that not only the, the Wikipedia about decentralized systems, but there's a great article of a company called Open Bazaar, which is seeking to decentralize the marketplace, commerce, if you will, with the use of Bitcoin as a payment method. And they discuss not only their company, but what uh, decentralized systems and what they're trying to do. And it's a company that I will be reviewing on Hiroja's Thought, uh, Hiroja's Thought Bubble in which I discuss uh, my experience with this type of peer-to-peer -peer system, uh, which is another term I'll discuss very briefly, um, not to get too heavy so we get into the news and the topics about the, the companies here uh, that I want to talk about that are resisting. But they kind of break it down very well and use a, a very standard graphic, graphic point that explains what a decentralized network is. So let's begin with the first highlight, if you will, that came out on us the day of our inauguration, Morpheus, which is obviously influenced from, you know, the Matrix. What Morpheus is, and I'm going to read from the website, and then I'm just going to break down the things for you here. This is on their about page. The future is a space to three. At this point in the early stages, Morpheus is a global encrypted distributed data store intended to replace the cloud of storage and far more. This first release also includes uh, Gmail, a distributed mail, inherently scam resistant, inherently encrypted, unsensible, and fully distributed messaging. Morpheus is a simple to run, accessible to everyone, download, double click, and your web browser now opens a window viewing that root Morpheus UI page, where you can already browse and upload to the next generation of the internet. Morpheus. Through the power of distributed technology, Morpheus is a software run by each of us to create an independent network that requires no centralized servers for control. Upload files to the network via the web browser, SHH client, or use MPC the command line Morpheus UI. Morpheus also starts the fundamental layer for the world frame. We'll talk about the world frame in a different episode, but uh, the idea of a unified human consciousness is a project that aims by the future of a truly free and open dialogue, knowledge and ideas, not only on the web, but in everyday life. If Morpheus is successful, I believe it has the potential to connect us all to a trust-based system via the next generation of the Internet. Depreciating necessary evil, making mass government surveillance impossible, and not to mention the future possibility of resolving human conflict into unity. Until then, it depreciates email, BitTorrent, YouTube, the Internet, etc. I'm doing this all free for all humanity because I hate evil. My number one guide, moral principle, is that I'm morally opposed to slavery in any form, in every form, including the covert, covert economic slavery powered by the lies that we use today in all nations that claim they do not allow slavery. I do not believe in the necessary evil. In fact, I know that there is no necessary evil, such as the only shortcuts which lead to destruction. Nothing will stop me from completing my life's work, my purpose in life. This is my calling. I am, for the years, already been working on this full time, and I will continue to do so until it's finished. Most important is that the project isn't about one person or even a few. It's about all of us working together to create the world we want to live in, free from corruption, slavery, evil, manipulation, and the vision they have thought impossible until now. Join me. Together, we can peacefully overthrow the existing system worldwide. 
So there's a, a lot of, to unpack here. Uh, you will find a lot of times with a lot of these projects that there is a lot of ideology um, driving it. Um, some of it is very idealistic based. Uh, some of it is a bit fringe. Um, in this case, not necessarily fringe, but very uh, progressive realm, if you will. But let's talk about the technical aspects. So basically, Morpheus is set to be a peer-to-peer -peer system. And peer-to-peer -peer is, you know, just as it says, as it states, you know, in the term. It's from one person to another person, interacting and engaging with no centralized authority. You don't go to, like, a Walmart or, or whatever to interact and engage. There's no middleman. It's just one-on-one. -on -one. Like, you go and walking down the street and seeing Sally at her lemonade stand and buying your lemonade from Sally. That's where you get your lemonade. It's just one-on-one -on -one and Sally gets her business from you um, because you, you like her lemonade. It's that type of a deal. Um, there's a number of different types of peer-to-peer -peer systems. Um, the sharing economy is built around that philosophy, if you will. You know, the decentralized system concept is built around the con built on the principle of a peer-to-peer -peer system. So there is no, again, a centralized authority, no middle person, nobody dictating or telling you the parameters upon which you can interact with. So that's the basis upon which Morpheus is setting to do with the program in itself. It is also, you know, distributed mail, uh, which is, you know, increasingly, increasingly going through um, the cloud. The, the reason why a number of different email systems are free is because, you know, Yahoo, especially Google, Gmail, they scan that information and then they spam you, if you will, with targeted ads. Uh, just if you type something or someone sends you an email and has a certain word queue, you know, it's very scary the type of ads you all of a sudden get because someone talked about, you know, a barrette that they wore back when they were like eight years old and just thought about it the other day as they were doing their child's hair. And all of a sudden you see hair products and you will add those with hair. So not only will that happen, but just in general, like this is a scuzzy spam thing because somebody is able to have um, your email address and just hits your junk box with all the bunch of crap that you get in your junk box. And also just in general, because it's encrypted so nobody can, you know, Spy on it, peek at it, look at it, or do any of those type of things, whether it be a corporation, another individual, a malicious actor, or a government. So that's a lot of the technical side. So the fact that Marcus, uh, when you download it, which I haven't done in and of itself personally, but it's something I, I plan to do this week, um, working on it and, and trying to see if we can get it to work. Uh, a lot of times with these um, open source projects, uh, particularly the new ones, it takes a couple iterations before someone that, such as myself, who's not very technical, is able to um, get it to work. Because if there's a bug, and you know how computers work and programs work, maybe you're able to work on that bug and fix it. If someone like myself, who just basically wants to download, click, is able to do some basic information in terminal, um, sometimes with some of these projects, I have to wait for the, maybe the second or third version. So hopefully, this is one of these projects that is robust, robust enough, if you will, that they went through this the process of making it easier for easy, as they're stating here, where I download it and I can work with my browser. So the basis of it, again, is where you're able to work through your browser, which is easy, very basic. Everyone knows how to operate a browser, a browser pretty much. SSH client, not so much, but it's more of, a, I would say, a back-end thing. And command line. Command line is basically the use of a terminal. Now, if you know what terminal is or a command line is, it's on pretty much every operating system with different, each system, what they call it. Windows has it. Uh, OS has it, you know, your Macs. And Linux, which is what I use, has it as a terminal. It's a little box when you click it up, and you're able to type in commands, a certain set of points of word entry, if you will, that will cause your computer to do different types of functions. Um, anytime you use a terminal or, or a command line, which is what the Windows term is, it's always to be very cautious because what you don't want to do is enter a series of commands and all of a sudden your computer is a pile of junk. It happens. 
So world brain is a, an idea of a permanent world encyclopedia. It comes from E.C. Well. Um, there's a link on the actual Morpheus page we'll actually go to that. It talks about unifying human consciousness. We'll talk about E.C. Wells and uh, the world brain in another type of episode. So Morpheus is a, an attempt to, again, to allow people to communicate across the system, a trusted-based system, um, which is a term that we're going to have to unpack in a later episode, but, you know, what a trusted-based system is, which is the concept of trust, which comes to not only dealing with logic, but also philosophy, that there's a, such a thing as a trust, if you will. And human conflict. A lot of times we defined with a number of these different types of programs and, and hardware, software, a lot of times people are, are just like, I want to be able to connect with anyone and everyone across the world, or anyone, whoever they may be, be able to use my product or use this system, so that they can do the same thing that I'm doing, so that we can meet, so we can interact and engage and realize that we're all just, you know, kind of the same, in a sense. So this is obviously something that is driving um, this person's particular philosophy and the need to build this type of system. Um, a lot of products, or I don't want to say products, but a lot of open source systems, and I guess I forgot to talk about what open source is, but a lot of open source systems seek to supplant or change or expand the ability of the internet in a different manner to I guess you can say supplant, like to prevent, you know, you're not going to the centralized thing of YouTube or even the internet itself. There's a lot of projects that are changing the very nature of what we know the internet is. And Morpheus is one of those type of products. But uh, I don't want to say products, but pro projects out there. Uh, email, again, it has a distributed email built within Morpheus for you to use. So you're not going to Gmail, you're not going to Yahoo. I uh, hope you're not using Yahoo, uh, using those type of email services. And then again, I get to go back to the philosophy here, you know, free of community, opposed to slavery in any form, about economics. Um, there's a number of, uh, what do you call it, anarch anarchist capitalist or well, we won't talk about that term yet, but, you know, and other people, there's actually a lot of people that are opposed to the capitalist system and that the type of system is inherently evil and needs to change and is responsible for a lot of, of the world's problems that exist. That we need a different type of economic system, a different type of relating to one another. And this person is taking the position that the way we're doing things in the economic system, basically capitalism, if you will, um, is not working for people. And that there is no such thing as necessary evil. It speaks to a unoccurring philosophy that um, influences a lot of people that are part of this technology movement. It comes out of the cyberpunk movement, um, which was influenced by the cyberpunk movement. The, the actual fictional movement is in itself. Um, it's a philosophy which we, will be a manifesto that we'll eventually read on the show. It's a plea for a rational principle of ethics um, called a non-aggression principle. And this is just a quick thing about it. The uh, non-aggression principle, or NTA, is a rational principle of ethics. Um, you find many, like, uh, libertarians, anarchists, and evangelists base their ethics and liberty on that non-aggression principle. A common course formulation principle is aggression is inherently illegitimate. Perhaps another definition is order to help set things straight. Regression is initiation of a course of relationship. Basically, it's instructing the fact that any form of general violent, threatening, or deceptive action to, manip to manipulate people's condition or decision is wrong. And even done to themselves, done to, to them personally, or to other people, they would not respond in kind. They don't believe in the use of violence to do the thing. They believe in using rationality and 
I would say avoidance and not reacting to a violent action and comment. That's the most general explanation. There's a, there's a lot to go with it because there's a lot of different other theories and philosophies that build up to this particular concept. But that I would just by reading this um, was a manifesto, but the statement here. Um, by Sam, uh, the creator of Morpheus, that I, I, I would think that he comes from that principle of a non nap and non aggression principle. I read with some of the statements here, like particularly the technology statements, the contribution of the world brain. Um, I do think that as we get more interconnected, that um, the resolving of human conflict is going to be much easier because we're going to be almost like, I want to say a symbiotic relationship or forming into some kind of human blob of connections. But I think as we can, as the, the connections and the barriers between cultures are increasingly becoming dissolved because of the communication devices that we do currently have access to um, continue, I do think that um, a lot of the conflict that is occurring in the world um, is not completely safe to exist, but it's not going to occur as often as it does, and it's going to be significantly just going to diminish. Um, again, you know, some people are just assholes. Some people are just hate to see for hate sake. Some people have bad, you know, bad actors have bad attentions, and they will always exist within the human condition, but they will not be so pervasive. They will not be the dominant authority. They will not rise so highly in any particular uh, society out there. They'll be dealt with early on or they will be um they'll push down to it and almost be a minimizing effect to where certain types of conflicts and stuff like that will not only have less and less of occurrence but it'll be almost an aberration. It will also the damage will not be as um world ending if you will. And world ending not in the sense of the entire world will cease to exist like in a nuclear bomb, but world in the sense that a particular culture or society as it was prior to the conflict ceases almost in the essence to exist and um and when it does put itself to get back together it is not the same as it once was before and it's changing to something completely different. It's a completely new society if you will. Whether it be better or grander or diminish, it all depends on the particular conflict, if you will, and you know, certain time factors go into that. Uh, I personally do believe in the, the necessary evil. I do think that there are certain actions that unfortunately do need to take place, and violent actions. I'm not a, I was going to say a nap, if you will, but I understand why some people believe this. I think that Personally, for my personal sake, the NAP and the whole concept of not taking violent action against people, if you will, that type, particular type of stance, or the stance of no necessary evil, is a very theoretical, very academic viewpoint of the world, and it doesn't really, it's part of a, you can say, wishful thinking. It doesn't allow for the actual basis of reality. You wish for a world to exist where there's no necessary evil. You wish for a world where there's no necessary need for violent actions. And unfortunately, as I've already stated, that, that is not necessarily the world that we currently live in. I do think the direction that this individual Sam is going with this particular project, this email project like that, that they're out there on the internet and will highlight through this show, will dissolve human conflict into unity. But I don't think it will be an absolute erasure of evil in of itself, unfortunately. So this is a, you know, an example of a, a peer-to-peer decentralized type of system that can exist out there. In this case, it's individuals who can choose to plant the cloud to allow for people to not only develop and create their own type of networks, but they can create their own type of YouTube or a SoundCloud or any type of system out there that they wish to do, or something completely new that no one even thought or considered before, and now can use this platform to do that. So that's Morpheus. There'll be a link in the show notes for that. The 
other highlight I want to talk about is on the same day um, as Morpheus, but it didn't come out on the inauguration day in ZeroNet. On ZeroNet, now ZeroNet is an open, free, unsensible website using Bitcoin cryptography in the BitTorrent network. It's peer to peer, again. Your content is distributed directly to other visitors without any central server, so it's a decentralized system. Um, it's unsensed and squares, no, nowhere becomes everywhere. Basically, all just like Morpheus and all pretty much all decentralized systems. So the individuals host the software, the necessary components on their own computers. So, in a lot of these systems, I have found you basically could go from something as simple as a uh, Two gig RAM to operate. I would recommend four gigs personally. So something as basic as a two gig RAM, so basically a computer that's ten years old or even two gig. Uh, I think we're coming out in 04. So something that's like 13 years old, you could operate and utilize a type of decentralized system like this. This is very basic. It's um, not so consuming of the computing power of your computer that you're unable to operate it. I've actually downloaded ZeroNet and created a website for the Roja Space uh, Privacy Network. I actually have to um, re-download it because I had to take it off because um, I have a lot of different programs I was using on this particular computer and I will I saved everything, um, the, the domain and the, the necessary components for me to re-download onto a different computer so that way I can um, get back onto the, the site through my personal zero blog site and um, be able to use it. Um, at this time I haven't um, purchased a big domain but I'm in the process of doing that. Um, I basically wanted to make sure not, not only downloading the zero net which I will do a review on here which is um, Thought Bubble which is where I basically do the reviews for the software, hardware and um, movies, TV shows, and books that I read that are from the tech space. Um, so I just wanted to see how it operates and works. And it was very easy. Uh, it's been around for two years. Um, I was able to download it. I was able to um, unpack it, configure it, get in and connect to um, the service. And get on to the blog. Um, I also have a link in the show notes and it was a very easy um, really easy thing to do and download and, and upload and stuff like that and there wasn't too much um, usage of the command line but there is a um, YouTube individual by the name of let me make sure I get them right uh, Ace Lewis has been making a series of tutorial a series of tutorials for almost a year now on ZeroNet, and the very basics, um, when there was an update, how did you, how the new update work, um, how to use new um, bit domains, name coins, um, how you can um, program ZeroNet to be uh, different things for your needs. Uh, very simple, very easy to follow, and it goes pretty slow. Um, the videos are typically not long. I think the longest I ever saw was like 20 minutes, but most of them are like 5 to 10 minutes long. I uh, use these very simple terms. Your walk, you basically walk, it's a walkthrough, if you will, about how to utilize ZeroNet. And I found it to be one of the um, easiest and, and the simplest to follow along. There's a few others if you were to just uh, type in ZeroNet and just even to the side of this is uh, YouTube, you can find stuff like how to um, do a torrent site, if you will, um, how to, you know, use for, use proxies so you, you can um, do things. Um, and I found it very, very simple, very easy to use. I think because it's a website builder, if you have an understanding of CCS, of HTML, how to build a website, and you're interested in something like this, a decentralized web builder, if you will, website holder, and host. You know, this is something that you could use and be able to put up, like a blog post or a business, if you will, 
or any type of media that you think um, or service that you think of a website page where you would need. And this is good for sites like, for example, um, a number of marijuana businesses for a while, very early on in the decriminalization here in the state, weren't able to host a lot of their sites to these different um, places because they were getting shut down by either state government or by the website provider themselves because they didn't want to be associated uh, because of the federal law. Um, Facebook to this day still doesn't allow for the advertisement of um, legalized state businesses, which is marijuana is, or even the medicinal marijuana uh, ads on their, on their site. So something like ZeroNet would be the idea for um, emerging uh, emerging industry like Bitcoin, not Bitcoin, but marijuana to utilize so they don't have to worry about that type of censorship, censorship with their page being taken down and the customers not being able to find that information. But again, for someone to order to view ZeroNet, um, you would have to um, be on the platform in itself to be able to search um, the different websites. But it might be an avenue that might be necessary um, for certain types of businesses that are not um, preferable to state agencies or state actors, if you will. Knowing that, that you're able to use things like the Tor network, which we'll discuss um, at a later date, to be able to hide your IP address, be able to go on anonymously and not have to worry about um, somebody looking at your information and tracking you across the web. Um, you can browse sites or cheating even if your internet connection is down. There's a lot to the zero net in and of itself as um, very ideal. Um, and it's, it's not like a cloud provider, it's not like a video or voice uh, disruptor, so there's not a lot of graphics involved. It's just basically building a website, a very fundamental basic part of the internet. But because it's peer to peer and it's a centralized um, platform and it's very similar in the sense to Morpheus as a way of disrupting the already existing infrastructure of the internet where you use tour or like peer to peer where you're not utilizing something like Namecheap or GoDaddy or uh, Amazon Web Service or Squarespace to host your website. You're able to utilize your own internal computer and host it in a very simple, easy manner across the world, if you will, in various um, manners without taxing your computer system because it's seated throughout the world. Um, so you're able to have your website up, people are able to view it, people are able to comment, if you will, depending on how you configure it, purchase items, um, if that's the type of business you're in, and you don't have to worry about it being taken down or pushed offline or even, I wouldn't even assume um, it might be DOS tools, but um, not positive on So the other item that came out that was big on Inauguration Day, January 20th, was the relaunch of all of it. Now, that name sounds familiar is because of Edward Snowden, which I think by now everyone pretty much knows who Edward Snowden is. He's a very controversial whistleblower. He disclosed of the, the extent which many people and other whistleblowers have stated before that the document dump that um, Edward Snowden did with his interviews to the Guardian and various news organizations um, further proof and revealed that it was the level of government surveillance that's occurring throughout the world via the United States and other nations. And just as a little quick aside, about all of it. It's an open source encrypted web webmail service um, founded in 2004, I'm getting this information from the uh, Wikipedia. Uh, the service extended its operation on August 8, 2013, after the U.S. government ordered to turn over its secure socket for an SSL private key in order to allow the government to spy and Edward Snowden's email. A lot of it was owned and operated by Aladar Levison. Um, love of it announced that they would start operating again on January 20th, 2017. 
And um, I have two YouTube videos that kind of um, explain the history of Lazar Levitin and why he created Lazabit. It basically was to um, counter um, Google from Gmail. I'm going to read um, his reload. He also had a white paper that I haven't finished because it's 140 pages. That is personally a lot to read for a technical document. Uh, to compare that to Bitcoin, which was only 11 pages, and there's a gap paper there, and I've read there was like only 14. So it's a lot. But here we go. Um, January 20th, 2017, fellow citizens and LavaBit users. Today is Inauguration Day in the United States, the day we enact one of our most sacred democratic traditions, the peaceful transition of power. Regardless of one's political disposition, today we acknowledge our shared values of freedom, justice, and liberty as we secured by our Constitution. This is the reason why I've chosen today to relaunch LavaBit. In August 2013, I was forced to make a difficult decision, violate the rights of the American people, and my cool customers were shut down. I chose freedom. Much has changed since my decision, but unfortunately much has not in our post modern world. Email continues to be the heart of our cyber identity, but evidenced by the recent jaw-dropping headlines that remains insecure, unreliable, and easily readable by an attacker. Today we start a new freedom journey and inaugurate the next generation of email privacy and security. In 2014, with Kickstarter funding, I started development of the dark internet mail environment, Dime, a revolution end-to-end -end encrypted global standard in Magma. When is it that that's from Magma? Oh, Austin Howard. I think that was the name, a phrase that Dr. Evil used. It's associated with Dime. Capable of free and open source email service. Today I'm proud to announce that we have used Dime and Magma to the world. Dime provides multiple modes of security, trustful, cautious, and paranoid, and is radically different from any other encrypted platform. Solving security problems, other than that, Dime is the only automated federated encrypted standard designed to work with the different services providers while minimizing the leakage of the metadata without a centralized authority. Dime is the end-to-end -end secure yet flexible enough to allow users to continue using their email without a PhD in the cryptology. Former Lava users will be able to access their accounts in trustful mode and update their credentials to the new Dime standard. Anyone who wants a future Lava account can pre-register for our next release available in all security modes. Anyone can access our, our free open source library and associated command lines capable of creating and handling the new Dime standard. Anyone with a domain can develop, deploy Magma, or implement their own encrypted Dime compatible servers. These are just the first steps that many are impl implemented goes are to build the graphical clients for Windows, Mac, OS, iOS, and Linux, Android, and help others implement this new technology. Today, the democratic power we transfer to keep identity safe is in our own. With your continued patronage, we will store privacy and make end-to-end -end encryption an automated, automatic ubiquitous and open source reality. Your freedom, liberty, and justice. Millard Levison, owner and operator. So we kind of break that down a little bit. Um, again, this is an open source project. I still have a standard term, so I'm going to do it right now. Uh, open source is basically that anyone can copy, utilize, modify, and change the software or hardware program. It is open to anyone to utilize. And we're going to go over the history of open source in later episodes, but basically a number of the different key programs that we utilize currently on the internet is open source. Anyone that allows their code to be reviewed is very good because it allows for anyone and everyone to see what's going on with the code. When it's open like that, even if the company says that no one can utilize the code, um, it allows for people to be able to see, you know, if it's buggy, if there's any back doors. Uh, particularly, a lot of open source programs, um, it, especially when it's private concerns like these, uh, like LavaBit, it allows to make sure that there's no loopholes. There's no, like I said, no back doors, but no bugs really, and that there's no attack vectors that might not have been seen by the individuals that 
for building the code, people that were testing the code, you know, just more eyes that you put on something, the ability to see, I guess you can say the forest and the trees is possible. What else is really going on? Oh, so another thing about lava bit that's different from say the, the projects I talked about with Zero Net and Morpheus is that you have to play, pay to utilize it. The pay but um, Morpheus and um, Zeronet, you just download the program, it's free, it's free to use. So this particular email program, um, the storage for a standard is 5 gigabyte, the price is $15 annually, and there's a premier one which is 20 gigabyte and it's $30 annually. Um, this is, I guess you can say, the initial price. So the, the true retail price for a yearly membership is $30 and the premier is $60. When it first launched, it asked for credit card information. One of the reasons why I didn't get it or signed up for it. Um, but when a lot of people started saying, hey, 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 why are you asking for my credit card information for a privacy service? What happens if, you know, my credit information gets hacked or gets lost out there that someone knows I'm using LavaBit? That's when Bitcoin came in. And I'm hoping that maybe eventually either Zcash and Moreau or Dash might be on there, which are more private emphasis cryptocurrencies out there. But right now, Bitcoin is the number one kind of standard um, coin that people utilize, particularly with a lot of these um, tech-based companies. So you can pay with Bitcoin or you can pay with your credit card. I highly recommend if you're very high, um, private, you're, you're really concerned about your privacy, I would use it. So I just want to do a little bit of explainer on what DIME is. Um, you, again, I have a link in the show notes directly to all of it. But DIME is basically what he, they're trying to cover here. I'm just going to read from the website, um, developed by Lavabit, Dime is an open source secured end-to-end -end communication platform for asynchronous messages across the internet. Dime follows in the footsteps of innovative email protocols that takes advantage of lessons learned during the 20-year history of the PGP-based encrypted communication. PGP-based is pretty good privacy. Um, we will discuss what that is, but it's a crypto cryptographic protocol, if you will, and it's very much a standard that is utilized to encrypt their communication. And it's a bit cumbersome for anybody to use. DIME is a technolo technology evolution our current standard. Open PGT and S slash MIME, which are both difficult to play and only narrowly adopted. Recent revelations regarding surveillance have pushed Open PG and S MIME to the forefront, but these standards simply can't address the current privacy crisis because they don't provide automatic encryption or protected metadata. By encrypting all facets of an email transmission, body, metadata, and transport layer, DIME guarantees that the security of users and least amount of information leakage is possible. The security first design, DIME solves problems that plague legacy standards and combines the best of the current technology into a complete system that gives users the greatest protection possible without sacrificing functionality. So we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, metadata is pretty much what gets you. If there's a thing that if anything else that gets you is the metadata. If they can tell the date, time, the computer that you were utilizing, the actual email service, um, sometimes with metadata you can even tell you how, how, how many words or how long you were on a particular site. Um, when you're tracking across a person's um, profile and you're trying to profile them and you're able to track across the internet, you can vector and figure out at what point in time they're going to go on a particular site, um, what type of interactions they have, how long they're going to be there. So you can probably, if you're going to be malicious, you know, target their, oh, let's say they go into a, my, a Minecraft board. And they're communicating about Minecraft. You can probably target not only that particular Minecraft website, but that particular board or sub board that they're in. Um, maybe they're big on to building castles. And you can put up a malicious virus to target the computer. 
or um, to keep them on there so that they can eventually, you know, track their actual location, your IP addresses and your metadata. There's a lot of things or information that you can easily identify and track down per a person, even if they use you know, disposable emails, um, different types of um, handles online to circle back and find the real live person. So this is in close on about model bit. Um, you know, memorize the metadata, takes to be trusted, secure, reputation based, simple, and multiple modes depending on the level upon which you wish to function. And basically I think a lot of this has to do with skill sets. Some people are very skilled and some people are not. And I like this three three layered approach that they're doing here. And then Magma, again, is the um, all of its open source, commercial grade, and fully featured, feature ready for use with a dark internet mail environment. Um, Magma is now ready for commercial implementation and will be finally in terms of its businesses transmit encrypted data, whether you're an individual SME or a corporation enterprise wanting your own dime compatible server. The all of that technical team can assist with the implementation and development needs. So, Basically, just you know your basic emails so that none of your customer data can get out there. Um, if you have competitors, they can steal the information. Um, I know that China, but China's not the only country. But a lot of times, China somehow magically gets the uh, IP of a particular company and starts building it in. Um, China and gets ahead in the competition, if you will, by developing the same type of product that you are, and is able to get it out to market before you could, or I have there at a cheaper price. So, you know, a lot of these type of deals, you know, having a type of a secure email service will might be helpful for a lot of people. Or I can see this being utilized for activists, I can see this utilized for medical information, um, or those in general purpose uses for people who just simply don't want anyone to know what it is they're doing in the world. So one last thing about uh, decentralized systems. A lot of them are just much smaller projects with big ideas that may not necessarily have the level of funding that gives you a lava bet or the co-level skills that give you a Morpheus or a zero net. But they do seek to change the world nonetheless anyway and, and seek to make, you know, communication and community better or just in general the ability for people to not work with the or not work with the existing infrastructure but outside it and build a better one. So there's a project called uh, Dowis and it's a decentralized automized Autonomous organization on wireless ISP methods. And ISP is, you know, your internet service provider. So from their website, welcome to Dowis, a proposed worldwide network of independent ISP owner operators sharing distributed routing tables, DNS systems, payment processing, and technical support. The organization is born from the need to preserve the net as an independent creative zone in a mental and social frontier space. Uh, Dallas is not a free-to-use project supported by volunteers or an ad hoc a mesh network system. It's a reliable, professionally operated telecommunication telecommunication grade network constructed in a parallel to the current state or corporate controlled infrastructure. Participating in the network is on your merits, open to all who demonstrate the necessary technical skill. It requires hard work, but is rewarded both financially and intellectually. Uh, Dowless is a developing project, so send us an email for access to our forum. We'll be posting news and growing community. So basically, what this, this um, project is seeking to do is, you know, create internet providers out there that are not um, like Google or even Apple, Time Warmer, or Comcast, or any other the global co-op. Co uh, like, you know, uh, global corporations or collaborate. Oh, I can't say that word. 
that exist out there or currently exist right now that are all merging into one big blob, if you will. Um, and this pro this project seeks to develop, I guess you could say, a series of small businesses out there that are tied to that that allow for people to connect and create and um, be one together, and which is different from Mesh Network. Uh, Mesh Network is a series of wireless routers to wireless transmitters that are connected together to create um, an internet in a, a particular base, whether it be a purple bean, a small region, a cafe, um, even a township, if you will, uh, connected together in a cooperative fashion. This project seeks to go to the concept of being um, I want to say a small business an innovator or one of those small business uh, groups that you see that get together. There are, are an association, if you will, but not necessarily direct that, but still kind of in a similar vein or principle. And getting people to be able to do this and work together and build off of. It also seeks to use um, cryptocurrency as a means of payment for this new parallel development of. Uh, internet infrastructure. And that right there kind of concludes um, this is an interesting highlight of our topic of the decentralized systems that are resisting the current um, existing system. So I want to highlight tech I use. Uh, I use this program called Seabase. Um, I will give a review on the first episode of Herosia's Thought Bubble. But Seabase is basically a public file sharing system as well as a system of identifying people. Um, so I have my um, podcast handle and avatar and pretty much our handle for the internet in general called Herosia Shy. And it allows for the ease of usage of PGP, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And we'll talk about that when I talk about the base on Herosia's Thought Bubble, but also on here at the Metaverse. And it basically is like a, the most simplest way to explain it without going into too much detail is basically your identity, for the verification of your identity. So I use Herosia Shy by connected my Facebook, my GitHub, um, LinkedIn, um, Twitter handle, all these different public platforms and social media platforms that people utilize is connected to this particular identity. Now this of course is going to make it verify me as existing as that individual. I mean if someone creates a one day account, connects everything together and creates an identity, it's kind of suspect. Um, and that's one of the things which I talk about um, in my review versus some other platforms that utilize the same method but actually gauge and rate it by how long you use a particular social identity, so you'll get rewarded if you're actually using something that existed longer, which again, people could work around by using accounts or buying accounts or something like that. So the purpose is, is kind of allowing for trust verification, allowing for people to verify their identity, and allowing people to socialize, and you can verify and look and say, oh, this is the this is Herosia Shai. I know I'm talking to Herosia Shai because there's all these different accounts and it verifies and when I'm talking to her on Keybase, which you can do, you can chat and do encrypted messaging. I know that I'm getting that individual. Um, you can also host public files. Uh, there's both public and private files, which I can see this being like a new almost Google Drive or Dropbox for people to use. A lot of people, um, particularly in the early days of Dropbox and Google before they um, changed the, mat, their, the gigabyte and kind of shut down some of that, people you used to use those drives and share it with friends to share, you know, movies and music or things like that. I can see that ha happening as well. But also just you can share your, your publish your papers, you can um, publish your thoughts, you publish your ideas, maybe pictures from your vacation, places you went and you want to share it with people who, that follow you. And you can also follow people and you can look at their public uh, files that they want to share. Maybe they want to share their latest book because it's under the Creative Commons clause or Creative Commons license. I personally, what I did was I, um, in my public files, you can find 
not only um, the shows on the Horosha Shive network, but the complete uh, Musings of the Shive, all about 110 episodes on uh, key base for you to download and listen to, as well as the, the, my reviews of the two seasons of Mr. Robot under the um, F Society IRC podcast. So I will link in the show notes if you want to check out not only what key base is and um, I highly recommend to listen to Roger's Thought Bubble to get a more detailed explanation. But if you join right now as invitation only, so if you like an invitation, you can always tweet at me at uh, Hiroja Shine or at Hiroja Space On. I have a link here in the show notes to my um, Twitter handles. And I can invite you in and you can create your own your key base identity. You can either use your, you know, real life identity or your um, avatar identity or whatever identity you choose to do. I'm used to the verification process. I think the more social media platforms you're able to attach to your identity is helpful. You can also attach a Bitcoin address as well as a Zcash address. People can tip you or um, send you funds. So if you're interested in doing that, you can do that for me as well or for other people. So our manifesto for this episode, um, to fit in the theme of the episode, I thought this was probably the best one and also the, the best one for the first episode of, of the metaverse. The Gorilla Open Access Manifesto. Information is power, but like all power, there are those who want to keep it for themselves. The world's entire scientific and cultural heritage, published over centuries in books and journals, is increasingly being digitized and locked up by a handful of private corporations wanting to read papers featuring the most famous results of the science. You'll need to send enormous amounts to publishers like Mead elsewhere. There are those struggling to change this. The open access movement has fought badly to ensure that scientists do not sign their copyrights away, but instead ensure their works is published on the internet, under terms that allow anyone to access it. But even under the best scenarios, their works will only apply to the things published in the future. Everything up to now will have been lost. This is too high a price to pay. Forcing academics to pay money to read the work of their colleagues, chaining the entire libraries, libraries, but only allowing the folks at Google to read them. Providing scientific articles to those at elite universities in the first world, but not to children in the global south is outrageous and unacceptable. I agree, many say, but what can we do? If companies hold the copyright, they want to make enormous amounts of money by charging for access, and it's perfectly legal. There's nothing we can do to stop them. But there is something we can. Something has already been done. We can fight back. Those with access to these resources, students, librarians, scientists, you have been given the privilege. You get to see at this banquet of knowledge while the rest of the world is locked out. But you need not, indeed, morally, you cannot keep this privilege for yourself. You have a duty to share it with the world, and you have trading passwords with colleagues, filling download requests for friends. Meanwhile, those who have been locked out are not standing idly by. You've been sneaking through holes and climbing over fences, liberating the information locked up by the publisher and sharing them with your friends. But all this action goes on in the dark, hidden underground. It's called stealing or piracy, as if sharing a wealth of knowledge or the moral equivalent of plundering a ship and murdering its crew. But sharing isn't immoral. It's a moral imperative. Only those blinded by greed refuse to let a friend make a copy. Large corporations, of course, are blinded by greed. The laws under which they operate require it. Their shareholders would revolt at anything less. And the politicians, they have bought off back them, passing laws giving the exclusive power to decide who can make copies. There is no justice in following unjust laws. It's time to come into the light and in the grand tradition of civil disobedience, declare opposition to this private theft of public culture. We need to take information wherever it's stored, make our copies, and share them with the world. We need to take stuff that's out of copyright and add it to the archive. We need to buy secret databases and put them on the web. 
You need to download scientific journals and upload them to file sharing networks. You need to fight for real open access. With enough of us around the world, we'll not just send a strong message opposing the privatization of knowledge. We'll make it a theme of the past. Will you join us? Aaron Schwartz, July 2008. Hear more, Hillary. So I want to thank you for listening, for coming to visit me here at the cafe. Well, I'm going to ramble with you a little bit about um, the metaverse, the inspiration for the show, about resist and decentralized systems. Until I uh, see you again on the street, this is Hillary Shive from the North. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Ferocious Shine based on Steve Network production.